I've got half an hour and not much time. So, yep, I'm yet, yet another railway safety talk. I think it's the third of four. I'm told this is known internally as the railway track. Um, so, a bit about me. I'm a safety critical software engineer. Uh, so, I've spent my career doing air traffic management, air traffic controls. So that's the big radar screen that uh, you see them use. And uh, train born ERTMS ETCS equipment. There's a lot of acronyms. I will try and expand them all. Um, so, that is uh, some equipment that goes on the train and it's uh, on the driver's desk. I've got a picture later. Uh, disclaimer, these are my views, not my employers. So I think there's three key periods of time when you wanted to talk about uh, rail safety. There's up to 1890, um, and we'll cover why that is. The bit in the middle, and then 1980 to the present day, where we see um, the modern techniques that we use uh, come in. Um, I'm not covering, covering signalling all that much. Robin Wilson did an excellent talk uh, this morning on it, um, so um, hopefully that's, uh, that'll be a, be a recording of that if you've not seen it. Um, so in the beginning, it really was like the, the Wild West. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway opened in 1830. Um, on the opening day, the politician, William Huskisson, was killed. Um, he wasn't the first person to die on the railway, but um, obviously it was a politician, and uh, this made, the, the newspapers were interested. And the day got even better. So the Prime Minister was on the train. He got pelted with vegetables when they arrived at Manchester, because... Um, <laughs> Um, yes, uh, they were, the, the people of Manchester were not happy with the tax policy of the time. Um, so this all, they, all got into the press. People heard about these railways um, and, and they really took off. Um, private experimental car carriages were, were run. So Charles Babbage was a, a good friend of Eisenbad Kingdom Brunel um, and he had an experimental train with 30 tonnes of iron. And he orders this out at Paddington Station, and here's a train approaching. And he says to the uh, staff, well, I, I, can hear, I can hear a train. He said, no, 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 it's fine. No train scheduled um, for the next few hours. You, you, you're fine. Brunel appears from said train and steps down, having seen this engine at Bristol, summoned it, and driven at 50 miles an hour myself. So Babbage asks, um, so supposing you came across another train on the same line? Well, Brunel says he would have put... Put on all steam with a view to driving off the opposite engine by the superior velocity of his own. <laughs> Thankfully for um, mathematics and engineering, this didn't happen. But this, this is the sort of thing that was going on at the time. And there were quite a few accidents, um, and increasingly high profile. The, uh, the writer Charles Dickens um, was involved in, in a train crash and used his top hat to um, give people water and uh, administered brandy. Um, Brunel, a select committee hearing about um, um, regulating the railways, said that rail railway men would hopefully answer questions in a gentlemanly manner. Um, they were, railway companies were very suspicious about the government interfering in, uh, with them. Um, but by 1842, um, the Board of Trade could inspect the railways and prohibit them from opening um, if they thought they were unsafe. And they picked people from um, the Army Corps of Engineers for that because yeah, they were engineers and knew what they were doing. Um, and maybe if they from the army, the, the railway companies might listen to them. So that was for, they, that they formed Her Majesty's Railway Inspectorate. And things were improving for the passengers as well. By 1844, third-class third passengers should be provided with seats and be protected from the weather. Um, before then, um, third class was effectively um, animal wagons, so um, when sheep weren't being carried around, they could, they could carry passengers for a few pence. Um, and obviously those wagons were made of wood, and if there was a crash, the third class passengers got it the worst. Um, by 1871, 30 years after, we, after it was created, uh, the railway inspectorate finally got the power to interview people and seize evidence, um, but they couldn't um, force the railway companies to do anything. They could just harumph a lot and suggest things. Um, here's a picture of the first one. So this being Victorian, uh, they're all heavily mustachioed and they've, got, they've gone through a windswept look here, uh, reflecting his army background. So what were, what were they investigating? So there's some really shocking stuff. So at Round Oak in 1858, um, an excursion train um, carrying um, hundreds of people uh, was on its way and the guard was smoking and drinking and letting passengers experiment with the brake. Um, <laughs> In those days, um, carriages didn't have brakes themselves. You had brake vans along the train uh, with, with a big, big wheel handbrake you, you, you wound on. And uh, the carriages linked together with chain couplings. So there's uh, one in the middle and two on the side. And these kept braking and snapping because they were fiddling with the brake. And they'd stop and repair them and carry on. Except on the way back, um, these couplings finally broke. And the train, which didn't have any brakes, ran away and crashed. 
Um, you know, quite a few people died. The guard claimed to say the brake was faulty. They found a bit of the brake and it wasn't, and yeah, it was uh, not good for him. And then on the engineering side, um, the Tay Bridge disaster in 1879. So this was um, a dark and stormy night in Scotland, and a train leaves Burnetsland Station uh, next to the Tay Bridge and disappears in a flash of light. Um, this was due to wind loading, the construction of the bridge. They hadn't accounted for high winds, and the combination of uh, high winds and uh, the weight of the train made the bridge collapse. And the quality of the building was pretty poor as well. And the career of its engineer was ruined, and it also you know, killed 75 people at least. Um, the railway inspector actually had some trouble here. So the railway companies were harumphing, saying, well, they don't know about trains. What do they, what, why, should, why should we listen to them? But they did know an awful lot about bridges. So there was a problem for them there. But the result was that um, everything else was heavily over-engineered, which is why you, have, you see a lot of um, all this Victorian rail infrastructure is still here today. And yeah, that's a quick picture of it. Um, so the thing that really changed things was the, was the Armada disaster. So Robin covered a couple of these earlier. So the railway inspectorate had been arguing for decades about uh, the railway companies should adopt um, lock, block, and brake. So lock is full mechanical interlocking of signals, so the signalers can't um, signal conflicting movements, so that's where a, a train could be directed at another one, um, and a number of other things. Uh, block, the absolute block system, um, so um, the you know, railway track is divided into blocks and, on, and a train may only be in, that, in one block at any one time. No, other way around. <laughs> and continuous brakes, so this is a brake pipe that runs the length of the train and uh, if the train divides for any reason the brakes get applied um, and that's controlled from the engine. So what happened in Armagh on 12th of June 1889? A big excursion tr train uh, full of um, Sunday school children leaves Armagh station and in um, uh, what is now Northern Ireland. And there's a steep hill, hill to climb. And the driver wants uh, an assisting locomotive provided because uh, he thinks his might not make it. And it's refused. The station master at Armagh effectively said, um, drivers don't complain about excursion trains here, um, get on with it. But they decide the following train can assist if needed and, and give it a push. Um, as Robin said uh, this morning, so the, at this time they use the time interval system. So every 15 minutes they send a train out. So they say, oh, well, if that happens, then the next train along can give you a push up the hill. The train does indeed stall, and they decide to divide it. So um, they agree to, um, the train crew agree to put the handbrakes on the rear half of the train, take the little the half over the summit, and then go back and collect the rest. So they start putting handbrakes on and use sort of bits of rocks to, uh, to hold the boot to trocker wheels. The handbrakes don't hold, it rolls back down the hill and then collides with the following train, which under the time interval system had been sent on its way. Um, this was pretty horrible. So this killed 80 people, injured 200, and was the worst accident in the UK to date. Um, I think because it was full of Sunday school children, um, there was a public outrage at the time, and that led to a middle section. So. Um, the government finally intervened, and the Regulation of Railways Act 1889 gave powers for the lock, block, and brake that they'd uh, been wanting, so they could now command the railways to, in to install these things. And things gradually improved. Obviously, accidents were bad for the railway companies. They, they, they didn't want um, these accidents to happen. It was, you know, it was bad, bad publicity, and uh, especially in the early days, pe people might go back to the stagecoach. And uh, things, were, things were actually improving. Um, you know, there were um, sort of technological advancements. Um, World War I got in the way, so at Quintin Sill, also mentioned there this morning, um, a simple enough signal box, all of, the, all of the, uh, those three were there, and three passenger trains collided and killed 220 people, and it remains the worst accident in this country. But what's interesting is, why did it happen? So there was some, was there some it was arguably negligence from the signalers for, um, for not following their processes, but it was also wartime, so what do you, what, what do you make of that? Um, there were too many people in the signal box because the newspaper had just arrived and they were discussing news about the war. Um, everyone was working long hours. Um, the, uh, the guard was hanging around. It's, it's a lot more difficult than just saying the signaler was negligent. Um, that is part of it. Second World War comes along, and the big four railway companies in the middle on this, on this diagram were, were effectively ruined. They, they, the network, rail network was, was worn out. So British Railways was formed, and this 
helped hold the network together. Um, so in terms of safety, what's happening right now, um, the Great Western Railway was experimenting with automatic train control. This became the automatic warning system that Robin talked about from 1906. So this is uh, some equipment on the track that detects when a signal um, is not at green um, and, and sounds, a, sounds a warning bell. Um, and we're also starting to mitigate the effects of accidents, trying to work out if there is an accident, how do we make it less severe? So removal of gas lighting in coaches and coaches that um, had a lot of uh, wooden bodies. So uh, a nasty one here was Harrow and Wheelstone. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, signals not being, not being followed. But the key was that this Mark I coach that British Rail had come out was all steel, had much better couplings and survived the crash a lot better. So we're starting to understand how uh, the construction of carriages can, can help save lives. And also that um, signalers have had this, this interlocking and absolute block system for coming up to 100 years by this point. But there was nothing much for the drivers. So that's where the automatic warning system came in. And the inquiry into this one said that engine men should be given their share of technical aids to safe working. Um, and they suggested that the AWS be, be rolled out across, across the network. So again, gradual improvements up to 1980, but I think, I think here's where, where we, get, we get modern safety coming in. So um, this was mentioned, the Swiss cheese theory was mentioned at the um, boat versus, versus rig talk yesterday as well. So if you imagine a piece of Swiss cheese, it's got some holes in. Um, some of the holes stop before they get to the other side and some go all the way through. And in this, this theory, if, a, if, um, if you can see all the way through the cheese, that's some accident that, that, that's, that, that happens. And the thicker the trees or the more layers you have, the through a few holes. So you want, to, you want to make your trees as thick as possible. And this comes into, what if we assume accidents will happen? Um, if accidents, if we assume that, then we, need, then we work about how we're going to mitigate them. So we can reduce the chances of accidents occurring to begin with. So this is, um, this is known as a LARP, or as low as reasonably practic uh, uh, practic uh, sec, practicable. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so what this means is you need to consider things like um, cost is a factor, um, complexity. So there's a, there's a theory um, that if you add too many redundancies, um, that will actually increase the chance of, of an accident occurring as the system's uh, so complex. Um, I think that's one of the theories behind Three Mile Island, uh, the nuclear um, accident in, in, in the United States. Um, so you also want to reduce the consequences of an accident, as, as we said about um, new, new uh, coach designs. And all of this can be known as defence in depth, uh, and this is also followed by uh, quite a few industries. I think the IT security talk about this a lot. Um, but what about the people? So we're all, we're all human and, and we make mistakes. And fatigue, tiredness, frustration, uh, this is known about for, for, for a long time as well. If pe people are working, working too late or are exhausted, they, they make mistakes. Um, people can also be quite foolish. So in 1972, a driver of an excursion train drove his train to, I think, Margate, and then drank several pints of mild ale and then some brandy. Um, he was just a little bit over the limit, um, oops. and uh, yeah, his, he, he misread his signals, crash. Maybe we've learnt some lessons. 20 years later at Cannon Street in London, um, driver suspected to be under the influence of cannabis. He wasn't tested until several days after the, uh, after the event. Again, fails to break, crashes into buffers. Um, again, um, hundreds of, of injuries here. This was a packed commuter train and everyone was stood up getting ready to leave. Um, a lot of the injuries were caused by very old coaches um, that were the Southern Railway were in the habit of reusing coach, um, coach underframes and these dated from the 1920s. Um, what happens here? We have a lot more drug and alcohol testing, the old coaches get withdrawn, but the drug and alcohol thing is really, um, this was uh, what, 30 years ago and back then it was considered Quite common uh, if you had a few hours break, to, uh, drivers could go off to the railway club, have a few pints of bitter and, uh, and a sandwich, and, and then go back, go back again. And then this in 1991 was a step change. Nothing, um, it's now completely zero, zero tolerance on, on alcohol, as you might imagine. Um, a bit more recent, uh, Wotton Bassett in 2015, uh, a driver deliberately isolates his AWS that we've talked about quite a bit now. 
and goes past a signal at red and narrowly avoids um, really quite a quite nasty collision with um, a passenger train. Uh, steam trains uh, have to have uh, exactly the same systems as uh, any other one if they're on the national network, so that includes black box recorders and, uh, uh, and all of that. And the RAIB, more about them later, Real Accident Investigation Branch, find that the behaviour has almost certainly become an accepted practice among some train crews. Um, we'll discuss about that a little later. So this, this is saying the driver's done something monumentally stupid there, but is, why did he do that? We'll think about that in a moment. So in the early 1990s, we had privatisation. So British Rail was split up into lots of different parts. So it was split into Rail Track, who owned the infrastructure. Um, the allegation is made that Rail Track viewed themselves as a property company that happened to have trains on their property. Um, the Rosco, so Roscoe's are the rolling stock um, owners, so they own the trains. The Tox and Fox, so the train operating companies and the freight uh, uh, operating companies, so they run the trains, so that's things like um, uh, Great Western Railway, Northern, uh, Transport for London. Um, and lots and lots and lots of contractors and um, as we'll see it was becoming quite tricky to keep track of them all. Um, so this was the early, 90, early to mid 1990s and things ran okay for, uh, for a few years. I um, should also say that Mark on Coach that was um, in the 1950s was heralded as a brand new design, very safe. 40 years later, it was now outdated. Some, a number of accidents around this time, especially Cannon Street, uh, as in the, in the last slide. Um, it wasn't coming across too well, and they started to be withdrawn. But the wheels come off the privatisation with, I think, three key accidents. Uh, in 1997, the South Hall crash, um, again, a signal passed at red. Um, the, the automatic warning system was defective. So this is something that 50 years ago they said should be mandatory and rolled out to all lines. It was defective and no one seemed in a particular rush to fix it. Um, however, there was a brand new protection system installed on the train and the track. Um, it wasn't in use and there was a report uh, going on about the time to decide whether they should actually scrap the whole thing because it was costing too much. And all these newly privatised companies couldn't agree on who should fix things. So if the AWS was defective, is that if it's on the train, is that the owner of the train who fixes it? Is it the people that run the train? No, no, everyone argued about this and nothing actually got done. Um, however, uh, in this accident, the Mark III coaches, a, new, a newer design, they were praised, praised for their crashworthiness. More about, more about that later. Uh, in terms of rail track, in 2000, uh, a piece of track disintegrated underneath the train from metal fatigue and the train derailed and I think th um, six or seven people died, on this, died there. Rail track admitted they didn't actually know where any other defects could be and the entire network um, had speed restrictions for, for the best part of a year. Um, you might well remember, remember that, it was a pretty bad year. Um, Similarly, in 2002, there was another derailment where a train derailed in a platform and ended up wedged against, um, wedged um, between the platform and the roof. Um, it's an interesting picture. And the competence of the contractor there was really dubious. Uh, the contractor actually tried to accuse persons unknown as, of sabotage, um, which wasn't true. Um, the really interesting one, and you could do a whole talk on this uh, itself, is Labrook Grove, again mentioned this morning. But, a whole load of things were wrong with the industry here. The driver training wasn't good, um, the signalling scheme wasn't fully inspected, um, the train protection rollout system was very slow, so by this time they decided that they really ought to do something, um, but nothing had happened yet. Um, I think the three of these combined um, really was uh, a shock to the industry. So what happened? The Rail Accident Investigation Branch was formed um, on the first thing, so this came out of uh, South Hall and Landbrook Grove. One of the issues there was Her Majesty's Railway Inspectorate, who had been around for you know, well over 150 years now, there was a, a bias problem. So because they were um, having to investigate their own department, there was a, an issue there of you know, if they agreed to this signalling scheme at Landbrook Grove, which was a bit dodgy. Mm. But they're obliged to, so the Rail Accident Investigation Branch were formed to, to mitigate that. 
and they're obliged to investigate incidents causing death or serious injury uh, and also anything where if the circumstances were slightly different could have caused the same. The key thing is they don't apportion blame. So this, is, this is hard to describe, so I'll try my very best. Um, so, going back to that, uh, that steam train in, in 2015 where the, where the driver isolated his safety systems, why did the driver do that? So, the report found that there was a culture uh, in the company involved, um, which meant this sort of thing was tolerated as long as you didn't tell anyone. Um, it was thought that if you, it uh, causes delays to disappear, so the, uh, the, the system was isolated because the, the driver forgot to cancel the warning system and that put the brakes on, and there's a 60 second um, delay before you can release them. So he didn't want to have to explain why, he's, why, he, why he was late. Um, so it was understanding why the driver did, took, took that decision. Um, there was another really interesting one from um, two years ago um, involving uh, COVID, where on the, uh, a train driver on the night, uh, Boris Johnson in this country, um, announced a national lockdown. Uh, a train driver was worried about uh, childcare for his daughter, and this caused him to lose concentration and, and um, derail his train. And that's not blaming the driver, that's understanding the context in which people are in a very stress, uh, stressful situation uh, and, and any, any of our outside influences. Um, what else happened around this sort of time? Network Rail was created um, because Rail Track basically went bankrupt. And Network Rail was created because it was eventually decided that um, a company responsible for safety probably shouldn't be paying out shareholder dividends. And the train protection and warning system was, was rolled out. So they decided that um, a nationwide rollout of a, a, a really good speed supervision, signal supervision system, that would be ideal, but it was far too expensive, very complex, and would take a very long time. Um, whereas the train protection and warning system is a bit more simple. It does similar things, so it stops trains from speeding uh, in certain situations and going past uh, stop signals. Um, but it was a lot cheaper, uh, and it was also a lot faster to roll out because it could be retrofitted. So that's where we are. So, um, so that's uh, the sort of the state of things um, from the mid 2000s. So where are we now? Computers will fix everything, right? Um, we can automate a lot of these signaling problems away. All these confusions about um, um, obeying signals. Um, so on the Cambrian line in Wales, you have what's known as um, ETCS, so the European Train Control System. So the, this, uh, the train communicates with um, the signalling centre um, over radio and reads data from the track. And this is displayed um, on, a, on a display in the driver's cab. I've got a picture coming up. And one day in 2017, a driver spots that a speed restriction that's been there for several years isn't there anymore. And the signaller says that it is there. So something's gone wrong here. Here's a picture of the screen. Um, so this is showing a train travelling at 39 kilometres per hour and there's a speed limit of about 95 kilometres per hour. Um, so something, something, something went badly wrong here and uh, it was ultimately a database corruption error. Uh, there was a single point of failure in this software system and it took the software vendor months um, to reproduce the issue in their lab. And this is a bit concerning because software safety and software quality is taken uh, extremely seriously in the industry. Um, so from personal experience, from writing code to it actually going into service um, takes about a year. So some, something went seriously, went seriously wrong here. And the consequence from, the, from this is um, um, a lot closer look at software standards, um, much closer look at software standards uh, in the industry. Never mind. So, if we check our work more, software, whatever, that will be okay. So this 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 one was a couple of years ago. Um, I was thinking about doing a talk like this at, at EMF 2020, um, which didn't happen. Um, but I could, I'd have said then that the last fatal passenger derailment was in this country was 2007. Um, so this uh, and that was at Greyrig in, in Cumbria. Um, that's a really good safety record um, uh, for this country it, and um, the network in this country I think is the most reliable in Europe, if, most, the safest in Europe, if not the world actually. Um, 
Well, let's look at Carmen in 2020. So after a period of very heavy weather, very heavy weather, very heavy rain, um, train comes along, uh, there's some debris on the track and it derails and goes down a hill and catches fire. Uh, three people died at this car, very sadly. Um, if the train was, um, if this was a rush hour train, if it had been busier, um, which it wasn't because of COVID, there were about 10 people on board, it, it, would, have been, it would have been really terrible. Um, the ultimate cause was a, um, a drain that was trying to drain water from a field above the railway um, to stop, it, um, stop the railway flooding was incorrectly constructed. Um, the, di the diagram just wasn't followed. Um, so unfortunately, this goes back to Tay Bridge 150 years earlier of poor construction. Um, I think the, the specifications were okay, but it was just wasn't, it was never inspected. So once this drain was built, it should have been entered onto a computer system, uh, and that would have set a schedule of regular inspections. That It just never happened. No one knew it was there. Um, the signalling centre or the control room at, at ScotRail had a very comprehensive weather system that told them about um, uh, rainstorms, but no one had been trained on the advanced features of it, so it wasn't being used to its full extent. Um, and the Mark III carriage that 20 years ago was shown to um, be excellent and crashworthy was no, now seen being actually, it's, it's got some problems. So what can, we, what can we take from that? It's that nothing's, nothing's staying the same here. Everything, every, yeah, every, things move slowly in, in, in the rail industry. Things, things move in sort of decades rather than, rather than months or years. But they're always looking for improvements and then recognising, actually, this, is, this has been around a long time, and it's time, it's time to retire it. Um, where can you read more if you're interested in this stuff, sort of, sort, sort of stuff? Um, the Real Accident Investigation Branch, um, so their reports are really human readable. They have um, a good glossary, they explain all the railway terms that are not obvious. Um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, I, I, I really would um, pick, pick a few out. Um, the one at Carment is, in, is, is interesting, and the one about um, safety culture uh, for the steam train at Wotton Bassett is uh, quite good as well. Uh, the Railways Archive covers everything um, uh, before then, and also has some good cross-referencing. Uh, for readings, um, Red for Danger is um, a book that covers basically up to the formation of British Rail. Um, uh, it's, it's a bit technical, but it, it's, it, that's, that's pretty readable, if a bit depressing. Uh, Normal Accidents by Charles Perrault. So this talks about the Swiss cheese model and the theory that if you make a system so complex, accidents are just going to happen um, by the laws of probability. So it's best to try and design to mitigate uh, the consequences. So... Conclusions, so it's been 180 years now and we're still learning when we're still learning lessons. Um, I think in my opinion, sometimes we're a bit too proactive. Uh, so no, we need to be more proactive. Um, you know, accidents happen and we think, oh, why did they happen and, and stop them happening, happening again? Uh, I think we need to be a, be a bit more on the other side of, of thinking where accidents could happen. This does happen in the software industry. Um, other than that, that's everything. Um, I've got some notes and references to some of the accidents I've talked about here if you want to read more on them. Contact me there and thank you very much.